silent stars go by, yet in thy dark streets shine the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. For Christ is born of Dive into the Bible. 
time and, and see this, uh, this miracle uh, according to the passage. So Roman number one, the passage describes. As we think about it, we're kind of doing our investigative study, uh, trying to figure out some of the different things, answering some of the basic questions that God gives to us uh, about this story. Letter A, the place it occurred. And uh, trying to think about where it occurred, number one there, Joseph says this, the name and precise location where this miracle occurred is, anybody know? It is unknown. We don't know exactly where it happened. Uh, Luke only informs us that it took place in, as he says, a certain city. Now, he doesn't specifically say what city. But number two, uh, here's what we can surmise. Given its placement in Matthew's account, right after the Sermon on the Mount, it is logical to conclude that it occurred in the province of Galilee, near Capernaum, which we've obviously studied recently and understand that Jesus did a lot of his miracles and uh, a lot of things in that region and area, so, uh, so we can um, uh, kind of see that it was probably, most likely, we can guarantee, but most likely in that area around Galilee. So let her be then, the people involved, so there's the place, and of course the people, uh, and we all like to notice who was really involved. Uh, in this miracle. So number one, we can see Jesus Christ, who is the divine healer. And uh, I'm so thankful that he heals. I'm so thankful that he works in our lives. Uh, here he specifically does a, a miraculous healing. Uh, we can see of the 35 miracles uh, of Christ, let me remind you that 17 of them involved healing. And uh, here's one of those examples. So Jesus is involved in this miracle. Obviously, we uh, we claim that when we're talking about the miracles of Jesus. Right? So we're diving into the miracles of Jesus as we examine this. He needs to be there. And then secondly, number two is an unnamed leper. We do not know his name. But how many of you know this? He's somebody special to Jesus. And uh, we can see that he's pointed out particularly in this passage. And so let me kind of think about this. We can see he's, a, he's an unnamed what? Leper. So let's kind of think about leprosy just for a few moments. It's not something that you and I get to face each and every day. Um, in fact, uh, some of you uh, know the Amidans, and uh, Brother Kendall's dad had the opportunity and some family to be able, or uh, grandfather, uh, to be able to uh, minister and to work among some uh, lepers. Uh, and so letter A, let me kind of think about this a little bit. Leprosy is one of the oldest known diseases. Uh, leprosy has been around for a very, very long time very long time. In fact, the Egyptians recognized it before 1500 BC. Um, anybody there at 1500 BC? I'm like, and none of you were there. Okay, but 1500 BC was a long time ago. That's like 3,500 years ago. Okay? Uh, and uh, so we think about that. Uh, we can see record of it back then. I guess uh, maybe they had it in hieroglyphics. hieroglyphics. I'm not sure what that symbol was, uh, but uh, we can see that, um, that leprosy was really, really old. Letter B Think about this. The Hebrew word for leprosy comes from a root that means to strike, to strike. And uh, the Jews call leprosy this. It, it really kind of has some symbolism that's based off of it, uh, that that term is based off of. They call leprosy the finger of God or the stroke of God, indicating that the disease was a direct punishment from God. Okay, so when it came to this, uh, we can see it was something that they believed was absolutely incurable, except for the same divine power which allowed it in the people that were struck with leprosy. So we can see that they that idea of leprosy is communicated in the very word that they used uh, for leprosy in Hebrew. Letter C. Today, leprosy appears in two forms. Um, one impacts the nerves, and the other impacts the skin. Uh, the latter seems to be the kind that's described in Scripture. And uh, one of the reasons why is that we'll kind of pick up on that a little later, but we can see that uh, the Bible, what we typically see uh, as far as lepers uh, are those where leprosy affects the skin. Letter D, some medical people today liken leprosy, as described in the Bible, to Hansen's disease, so named after a Norwegian physician who in the late 1800s made some important discoveries regarding the disease. Of course, the thing about the 1800s, the 1800s is about when we started to understand germs and bacteria and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, we started to look at some different things there. And so because of that investigation, we started to learn uh, uh, an important amount of lots, uh, lots of different things, including leprosy and other diseases. So Roman numeral two, uh, we see here not just the people and the places and those types, but we also see this the problem. Uh, how many of you think it might be a problem if you have leprosy? Right? Anybody here leprous? Okay. I don't see anybody with leper here tonight. Uh, but if you were had leprosy, you would be pretty concerned about that. Um, and we think about that. 
I was kind of thinking about the problem declared. And, and the Bible reminds us about this problem. Look over at Mark 1, in verse number 40 there. And it reminds us uh, of this. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. So letter A, his disease, his disease. We think about his disease, his disease is leprosy. Uh, let me read this to you. This is a, a paragraph but written by Dr. David A. Redding. He says this, he said, Leprosy is about the worst thing life can think of to do to a man. No other disease can touch its hideous talent for, making, for mixing agony with horror. It strikes a small spot on the skin silently, like a viper, and no one notices it until the dreaded numbness sets in and the deathly snow-white color gives it away. Then the victim is subjected to a savage siege of terror as the killer advances slowly, relentlessly, spreading like a venomous stain, finger by finger, often erasing the face first, leaving behind a messy trail of ugly scabs and scores, uh, sores like open sewers. The hands are frozen into claws long before they drop off. The feet boil up into bandaged stumps before they are left behind. The leper's voice breaks into a cracked record of its former self, and his features draw tight into the infamous leonine look unto, until they too leave. The flesh rots off, bones give up, inch by creeping inch. Where it stops, nobody knows. In odor, in appearance, leprosy has no competitor. Leprosy is a pretty bad disease. We think about what it is that this man had. You can see in the scripture uh, how he describes coming to Jesus, and he was doing this. He was beseeching Jesus. He wanted his disease to be cured. So uh, we can see that this man uh, is written of in, in Luke 5, 12. Luke writes he was a man full of leprosy. So according, uh, we can see according to Leviticus 13, which kind of think about, uh, we're not going to specifically, you don't have to read Leviticus 13 right now. But here's four ideas. If you were a leper in Hebrew times, okay, in Bible days, uh, this is what would have happened. According to Leviticus 13, uh, number one, a leper was cut off from the community. If you had leprosy, uh, kind of symbolize it here. If you had leprosy, you were like quarantined outside of town. You couldn't live inside of town. So you were outside. Number two, a leper was to wear signs of mourning as if they were already dead. Okay, so when it came to mourning people and uh, when it came to what they wore, uh, it was supposed to be clear indication that uh, their body was unclean. Letter number three there, a leper had to shout unclean in order to warn others away. So suppose you didn't stay in town all the time because occasionally you had to travel outside of town. And there were some lepers that were out there. Maybe there were galleries and different things. But as you were encountering, uh, encountering and coming across a leper, if you were the leper... You would have to shout out to everybody else, I'm clean, I'm clean. And you would have to make sure that everybody stayed away from you because of the communicable disease that leprosy was, because other people could get it. And because of that, uh, you had to declare that. You had to be listening as well uh, for other people who may be around you who were lepers. Number four, a leper had to dwell alone. Some of you are going to have a hard time living alone, wouldn't you? When it comes to being alone. And here this, these lepers had to live alone apart from their community. So let her be there is desperation. I think, uh, truthfully, if we heard that we had leprosy, we would be desperate people. And this man, this leper, was desperate as well. In fact, we look in scripture, the word beseech means to plead or to beg. And here, in fact, some of you are familiar with Romans 12, 1, where the Apostle Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, we think of that word beseech that we see in the scripture in Mark 1, 40, and we can see how this man came and he was beseeching Jesus. Why? Because he was full of leprosy. Now, take this idea about how this man was pleading and he was beseeching Jesus to heal him from leprosy. Okay? Now, how many of you say, well, that's just kind of like a casual, hey, do you think you want to do this today? No, 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 no. This was a, a, a full entailed begging, Jesus, I need you to forgive me. Now, take the leper's idea 
and his pleading, and then I want it to have forever changed your opinion as far as the Apostle Paul and his begging. If you look at Romans 12, 1 again, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Here the Apostle Paul is pleading just like the, the, the leper was pleading that God, that Jesus would heal him. And so we in our lives, when we see that term pleading, this idea of begging in our lives, we need to see that this man was very, very serious. Uh, in fact, the second bullet says this. He was desperate because apart from a miracle, there was no, there was no cure. You know, we live in a, in a very interesting day because there are so many cures. How many of you have had a headache recently? So you took a pill, right? Uh, you go to the doctor and they can seemingly can fix this. They can, they can fix eyeballs and everything, right? And, uh, and they can do all kinds of things. It's amazing how they can figure all this stuff out. I mean, they, they think they're uh, a few years away from cure, curing this disease and that disease. And, uh, but there was no cure back in that day. Think about this. Jesus was the only cure for this man. And that's why this man came to Jesus. Letter C. His demeanor. He came reverently. By the way, that makes me think when we come to Christ, we should come with a demeanor that is reverent. We need to talk to the Lord as, and knowing that he is God. Number one, Matthew says that he worshipped. That he worshipped. Uh, we look at Matthew 8, 2. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And so Matthew says that he worshipped. Secondly, Mark says that he came kneeling in verse uh, chapter 1 and verse number 40 of our text. And then there came a leper beseeching him and kneeling down to him and saying unto him, and thou wilt thou canst make me clean. So we can see that he came and he says he worshipped. Uh, Mark says that he came kneeling. And Luke says this, he fell on his face. Luke 5, 12, when he came to pass, when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy. Who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Okay, so the third truth that we see tonight, or the third area, is the power display. This is the fun part. How many of you like when you get to this part of life? Uh, isn't it true, like, you wake up in the morning and start going through your day, all of a sudden you start to see all the problems, right? And, and it's kind of like a, uh, a television show, right? The, the, prob the, the show has to start out with all the problems. Otherwise, it would be no fun to watch the show, right? So for the next 30, 45 minutes or whatever it is, you start watching this show. You start to see all the problems, and uh, they start to show themselves. And so we can see the first part of the story is all the problems. But how many of you know Jesus is the cure for the problems? And so Jesus is going to take care of it. So here's the power displayed by Jesus Christ and that he is going to heal. So the power displayed in letter A is his desire. Now, whose desire is this? This is talking about God's desire because God... Jesus wanted to heal this man. In Mark 1, 40, again, says, And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and, and kneeling down to him, saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. So, number one, it's important to know that this diseased man asked for a cleansing, not just healing. Jesus made this distinction between healing and cleansing in uh, the book of Matthew 10, verse 8. He says, heal the sick. And he separated from that the next part of the sentence where he says, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Really, he have received freely gift. So we learn here, leprosy in scripture is set aside in part because, the, the bullet there in your notes, leprosy in scripture is an emblem of sin. And sin means this, defilement. When somebody was unclean, where they were a leper, they were considered to be unclean. There was nothing about them that was possible to be clean. Now, for a priest or for somebody else who was living in town or even a person, uh, people could become unclean, and then they could go through certain things or wait a certain period of time, and then they could be clean. But for a leper, there was no cleansing. There was no ability in them to be able to do a sacrifice, uh, to go to the temple, to do anything, and somehow become clean again. They were always and forever going to be unclean until the day that they died. So when it came to this, this man was asking for cleansing. Uh, the second bullet in your note says this, we are not healed or cured of sin. Wouldn't it be nice if you just take a pill for your sin and somehow you can take care of it? It doesn't work that way. 
We are not healed or cured of sin. We are only cleansed. Did you catch that? We are cleansed from our sins. Psalm 51, 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all, as in, you know the verse, an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we do all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. In the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanseth us from all sin. So we learn here in the word of God tonight that we are not healed or cured of sin, but we are only cleansed, and that cleansing comes through Jesus. And that is pictured by his leprosy. So number two, please understand, the leper was not doubting Christ's ability or power by the statement, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. You say, well, what was the issue? The issue is what we're talking about right now, about Jesus' desire. The issue was Christ's willingness. He knew. In fact, that's why the leper came to Jesus. Who was going to heal him? Who had the ability to heal the leper? The only person that did was simply Jesus Christ. The question, though, was would Jesus heal him? And that's why it comes back to the issue of Christ's willingness. So, number three in your notes, as always, Christ responded with compassion. Everybody say compassion. Compassion is an awesome thing. I'm so thankful that Christ loves us. And time and again in the scripture, we can see that Jesus uh, was compassionate. In fact, in Mark 1, 41, this is the first of at least six different miracles where Jesus was moved with compassion. Uh, we see that in Mark 1, 41. And Jesus was moved with compassion. And when he did that, what did he do? He put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. So we see that tonight. The issue is Christ's willingness and certainly Christ's uh, as always, he responded there with compassion. Letter B there in your notes. Uh, with, first we talk about his desire. Here we talk about his deliverance. Let's look back at Mark 1, 41 and 42. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. So we look at this tonight. And a bullet underneath that says, touching a leper would normally defile a person. You were to look over um, Leviticus 5.3. It says, For if we touch the uncleanness of a man, whatsoever uncleanness it be, that a man shall be defiled withal. And if he hid from him when he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty. So there's pretty uh, steep indication in Scripture here that reminds us about being defiled. But we can see here when it come, came to Jesus, touching a leper would normally defile a person, but it did not defile Jesus. And we know there in verse number 42, the word immediately, we can see that spiritual cleansing, like the cleansing of leprosy, is an instant through the touch, through the touch of Jesus' hand. And I'm so thankful. The picture, again, of leprosy of sin in Scripture, equivalent. And when it comes to leprosy, Jesus heals his leprosy immediately. The same thing in our lives. When Jesus heals us of our sin, it happens immediately. So it's a, a great miracle and example that we see uh, at the hand of Jesus Christ. Letter C, here's his duties. Okay, so you can imagine. Just for a second, you were healed of leprosy. Now we already saw how dreaded leprosy would be. You can imagine having lived with leprosy. We don't know how long leprosy has been in this man's body. He may have been missing some fingers, appendages, his nose. Who knows? He was probably transfigured in some way. He probably stunk. He had been telling for a long time and telling people for a long time, I'm clean! I'm clean! And he was living outside the town. He was begging bread. He was waiting for people to drop off provisions to him. But for a long time, he had been unclean. And you can catch what it is that Jesus tells him next. Okay, we look at scripture in Mark 1, 43 and 44. And he, speaking of Christ, charged him and forthwith, I like that word, forthwith, sent him away. And saith unto him, See, thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to who? A, the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto him. Them. Okay, so we look here at uh, these two verses, and here's a couple things. First of all, Jesus says, says that he says, first, he says silence. Uh, basically, in the passage, he says, say nothing to any man. 
So here's a man who's just been cleansed, and he has been saying what all the time? I'm clean, I'm clean. And here Jesus tells him, be quiet. Don't say anything else. So the first thing he says is to be silent, say nothing to any man. Secondly, he not just silent, but also showing. Jesus says, show thyself to the priest. Uh, the Bible says in Leviticus 14, verses 1 to 3, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought unto the priest, and the priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall look, and behold, if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper. Okay, so we see here's the description uh, there. Uh, what happens then? Uh, we can see we're going to follow up in verse number 4. The rest of the passage in Leviticus 14 describes what needs to follow after that. But Leviticus 14, 1 through 3, uh, shows us that initial uh, process of showing yourself to the priest. Coming to the priest say, okay, notice this. Somebody had to get the priest to come outside the town to verify that the leper was clean. And somebody goes in and says, hey, priest, we need you to come check out this leper. Formerly, leprous person see, is this person really clean? And then we can see number three, sacrifice. The Bible says, Jesus told him, an offer for thy cleansing. Now, we're not going to read it, but Luke, Leviticus 14, verses 4 through 57, record uh, the sacrifice that a formerly leprous person was supposed to offer. Um, if they had the ability to be able to do so, and if they didn't have the ability, there was some uh, recommendation to be able to fulfill this. But they were supposed to do a sacrifice. So we can see here, Jesus tells him, be silent. Secondly, show yourself. And he says that it's supposed to be a sacrifice according to the law. And then we can see letter D, his disobedience. His disobedience. Uh, Mark 1, 45. Do you all see what the first word of the verse is? But. So Jesus just gave him a command. And here's the leper. And the word of God. Here Luke, or Mark says this, but. Uh, Mark 1, 45. But he went out and began to publish it much. And to blaze abroad the matter. Insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without in desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. So we can see his disobedience, but certainly he did not obey Christ. Now, it would have been a good, how many of you think it's a good idea to obey, a good idea to obey Christ? And Jesus had a reason for him to be silent at that moment in time. We can see uh, some of the reasons why. In fact, we're going to pick up on that in, in Roman numeral 4, which is next there. The principles discovered. The principles discovered. So there's a few things to be able to learn as we kind of wrap up and can conclude uh, our study on the cleansed leper. Letter A, the leper's disobedience was a sin. You know what happened? It hindered the Lord's work. It hindered the Lord's work. Uh, we can see in the passage there how because the leper began to publish it and to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch the Bible says that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city but was without in desert places and they came to him from every quarter. So we look at this in uh, James 4.17 reminds us, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Sometimes we look at those passages and we think, well, maybe Jesus was doing reverse psychology on the guy, right? And uh, maybe he was saying, no, don't tell anybody uh, in hopes that this guy would actually go tell him. Well, Jesus is pretty upfront when he tells people to do things, and uh, he's pretty direct when he says to do things or to not do things. And so I uh, can't go along with that idea. Uh, but uh, we can see the leper's disobedience was a sin, and certainly it did hinder God's word. Uh, if news of his healing had spread to all the other lepers, and if they came to Jesus, many more people would not do to fear. That's another possibility. We think about this sin always hinders God's work in us and through us. Jesus wanted to do some other things in that hand. But because of his disobedience, it did affect other people who were there. And certainly let me remind you about this, that the end does not justify the means. Sometimes we think, oh, you're thinking, here's the end goal. And sometimes we say, well, it's okay to do a little bit of wrong. I've heard people tell me, it's just a little white lie, right? And uh, sometimes we try to say those things. Let me just remind you, when we lie, it's not the truth. And so it's an important thing to think about what we're doing because the end does not justify the means. Uh, we can't follow along with that uh, reasoning. A lot of people follow that idea as well. If the end is right and everything else is good, that's not so. Let's make sure that we do things the right way. Letter B, when this leper came to Jesus and worshipped him, 
in Matthew 82, Jesus did not stop him. How many of you know Jesus is worth worshiping? Uh, we just had Thanksgiving last week. I hope, you're, I hope that you're not done worshiping Jesus. Hopefully you're not done thanking Jesus for what he is, continues to do in your life. I know we kind of come quickly out of Thanksgiving, and then we launch right into Christmas. And we go from thanking God, and then we transition into our wish list for Christmas, don't we? And even as adults, don't we? We like to get things along the way. And uh, there's things that we like in life. And so when it comes to thinking about these things, we see this man, uh, he came to Jesus, and he worshipped Jesus. Spurgeon said this, he said, our Lord did not repudiate divine honors when they were offered him by his followers. But he accepted them as a matter of right since he counted it not robbery to be equal with God. And I believe that's the uh, idea of being equal with God is Philippians 2, 6. Think about this. Here's a couple of holes there. Think about Peter. Peter refused worship. There were some who wanted to worship him in Acts 10, 25 and 26. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Uh, so Peter recognized he's not supposed to be worshipped. In fact, Peter took him up, uh, saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. He recognized that people shouldn't worship him, but Christ should be worshipped. In Acts 14, verses 11 and 15, we can see Paul and Barnabas refused worship. Very interestingly, at that point in time, some of them said, hey, they are gods. They kind of thought that they were gods. Uh, in fact, which when the apostle Paul, uh, Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and a sea and all things that are therein. So Paul and Barnabas refused worship. Uh, in fact, when it comes to angels, angels refuse worship. If you look at Revelation 19.10. Uh, as John is writing the book, he sees the angel, and he says, I fell at his feet to worship him. He said unto me, See thou, do it not, I am thy fellow servant. Uh, we can see uh, in Revelation 22, 8, and verse number 9 as well, uh, how uh, John was going to bow and worship angels, but uh, he didn't. Uh, and certainly, let me remind you about this, there is one other person in this world who seeks worship, besides sometimes you and I, that would be Satan. And Satan does desire worship, Matthew 4, 8 through 10. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So let us see there in your notes. It is ironic that Jesus commanded the leper not to tell, and he did. Okay. How many of you just wish you could sit down with Jesus like this? And he, he would just meet with you. How many of you read the Bible? Like, how many of you wish Jesus would just, like, when you read the Bible, all of a sudden there's Jesus. And he's sitting there talking to you. Wouldn't it be pretty cool? And he tells you to do something that day. Okay, maybe in the next little while you're supposed to go do something. And you leave that conversation, and the very next thing you do is you disobey exactly what it is that Jesus told you to do. That's exactly what the leper. The, the former leper did. Uh, and, I mean, hundred. I mean, God, Jesus was doing a great thing in his life, and guess what? Jesus told him not to tell, and he did. And today, let me remind you, he commands us to do what? To tell, and we don't. Isn't that true? So many times we have opportunities to share Christ with other people, but what are we doing? We're not telling people. We think about the opportunities that we have. We can, uh, uh, thankfully, that's why we're trying to take the kids over to the nursing home tonight. Why? So they can tell other people about Jesus. Why we have Christmas programs and why we have to do all these different things that we do. It, 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 it's so that we have an opportunity not just to gather people, but to be able to tell people about Jesus. Because Jesus is the one who can save people. Letter D, do not miss the point that compassion led to contact. Compassion led to contact. Mark 1, 41. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. You've heard this expression. This is a, a quote there underneath of this. People do not care how much we know until they know how much we care. Right? Has anybody ever offered to you advice, maybe that was unsolicited, along the way? And you're like, hey, uh, 
I really didn't ask for that. You ever said that before? Do we have to be careful? Because sometimes we like to help people, but we don't always help people compassionately. It's an important thing to have a relationship with people and to help people because they know that we care uh, rather than just trying to offer our, our unsolicited advice. When it comes to compassion, when it comes to ministering to people, I believe there's one thing that the Church of Jesus Christ needs to do is make sure that we are loving other people. And by the way, that takes time. That takes effort. That oftentimes takes getting outside of our comfort zone and praise the Lord for this. We don't live in Old Testament times, so if you came along with somebody and maybe they have a rough lifestyle, they may not smell like you, they may not, I don't know, look like you or whatever, whatever you think people are supposed to look like and smell like them, okay? The fact is this, if you get alongside of them and you have an opportunity to minister to that person, God will use that. Let's make sure that we minister and we care for people. Letter E, the Old Testament law was powerless to cleanse. Did you ever think about that? The Old Testament, it was able to cover over sin, but it wasn't able to wash it away. It could pronounce a man cleansed, but it could not do it. And by the way, this is still true today. I'm going to conclude with Romans 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. There's nothing you can do to get clean before God. The Bible says this, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. You can learn about sin by the law, but the law never made anybody holy. Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and his love is what sets us free and gives us new life in the Lord. So we think about this tonight, think about the cleansing of a leper. I'm thankful for the example, and I hope that we'll take these things to heart tonight to make sure that we share Christ with others, we share compassion, we share the truth of Jesus Christ, and we help to point people to the truth that only Jesus can forgive their sin. Let's have a word pray. Lord, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for the example, the testimony of this miracle through Jesus Christ that a leper, in another passage, multiple lepers were healed by the touch of Jesus' hand. We thank you that the healing, the cleansing, happened immediately. We thank you that you washed the leprosy away in a picture of the beautiful picture of what you do for our sin in making us whole again in Jesus Christ. Lord, for those that we know that don't know Jesus, we ask that you would help us to share the truth of Christ that their sins would be washed away, that they would be made clean in him. Lord, help us not to be negligent of the responsibility that we have to share Jesus Christ and to communicate his truth and his love to others who are around us. We thank you for this Christmas time and the opportunity that we have to be able to do that in many different settings. Lord, I ask that you would help us to be mindful of the fact that only you can save. There's nothing that we can do, not by the deeds of the law, not by the deeds of the flesh, that somehow we can earn your love and your forgiveness. The Lord Jesus came and he offers it to us. Lord, for anybody that may be here tonight and the sound of my voice or... When it comes to the opportunities of sharing Christ that we individually have, we ask that you would help people to hear the truth of Scripture and to turn from their sin and to let Jesus cleanse them and make them whole. We ask that you would dismiss us tonight with your blessing. Please bring us back at any point in time. For those who uh, have different things going on in their lives, Lord, help us to make it uh, an important thing in our lives as we walk with you and follow you and we help others around us to know about the great healer of Jesus Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you all have a great night tonight. Thank you for being here this evening. And I look forward to a great uh, time again this coming Sunday. Lots of activities over the next few days. And